York City, is that there's always something you didn't know about, um, and always something that now makes you eager to go and visit. And Poster House opened up in summer 2019, just a little bit before I came here, and I, when I found out about Poster House, I thought, oh no, my old job, I was just blocks away. <laughs> if only I had known. And um, then obviously with COVID and all, none of us have been as adventurous as we should be. But when we met a few months ago to talk about having an evening with Poster House, and I have to thank Maria Palandra who brought Poster Woo! House to my attention, um, I was immediately in love because we often don't think about kind of the legacy of graphic arts and how much um, posters and um, what I'll loosely call advertisements are around us all the time. And you know, there's so many great examples and I will give one example that when I was in California many years ago, there was an exhibition called Made in California. And the most fascinating part of that exhibition was all of the fantastic advertisements and labels that were made for the agricultural industry. So these beautiful <coughs> works of art that were on orange crates <laughs> and artichoke crates. And, and I think, you know, we're gonna be surprised that, you know, Italian artists of the early 20th century were very important in this movement. Um, and you know, if you go upstairs uh, to our third floor, there's advertisements for various liquors uh, and wines and cruise ships and trains. And they're really iconic images, but we've sort of forgotten about them. So Poster House <laughs> is going to bring all of that to light for us tonight. Um, and actually, one thing I, I don't mention this year, I'm currently working on a show with the Cerulli Foundation in Italy that will hopefully be an Italian food and wine advertising exhibition for a few years. So like, where your target audience? Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, so as Lisa said, I'm Angela Lippert. I am the chief curator of Poster House, which is the first and only museum in the United States dedicated to the art and history of the poster. Uh, so tonight I'm gonna give you an introduction to poster history uh, and some of the greatest hits that happened along the way. Uh, the entire purpose of this is to give you a foundation to look at and appreciate posters. Uh, so no question at the end is too weird or silly because once upon a time, like many of you, I had no idea that posters were important, interesting, or incredibly valuable as historic documents and objects of art. Um, so please ask me anything you want at the end. So, there we go. Uh, so the first big question is, what is a poster, and how does it differ from, say, a broadside, a print, a handbill, or a flyer? Um, all of these things are distinctly different types of ephemera. Uh, ephemera being printed matter traditionally meant to be thrown away, so like ticket stubs, or newspapers, or playbills. Uh, now this question is actually uh, hotly debated uh, in the poster com community, but because I'm an authority on the subject and a very opinionated person, I'm going to tell you how I, and many people like me, define a poster. Uh, and some of you may disagree, but uh, I have a microphone. <laughs> so the definition I like to give is that a poster is an ephemeral, public-facing notice meant to persuade that marries word and image. I said that very slowly because there's a lot going on there. Uh, so let's break that down. A poster is ephemeral, which means it's meant to be disposed of rather than saved. It's not precious. So if it's a poster uh, that says some sort of like inspirational quote, like live, laugh, love, uh, and sold on Etsy that you then like frame and hang in your home, uh, that, that's not a poster. Uh, that's a decorative print. Uh, posters aren't created to be saved. So looking at what we have here, uh, Latrex print of Marcel Linder in uh, Marcel Linder arm boost that was a, just about to go away. That's a print, not a poster. It was meant to be used decoratively, so bye bye Marcel. Now, the next one, a poster is public facing. So that means it's meant for external or otherwise public interaction. It's not a private piece of art that you only see in your home. It's not something that you tear out of a magazine. It's not something that you buy at Walmart and then hang in your dorm room. Uh, although those things are often mistakenly called posters. Uh, instead, a poster is equally available to all members of society in a given area. So when you walk down the street and you see a poster advertising Pepsi, that's public facing. 
It's, if it's in a local bar advertising wet cloth, that is also public facing and probably a poster. So like this previous requirement, if it's only meant for your house or apartment or whatever, uh, and if it's not pasted somewhere, it's probably not a poster. So the flyer in the lower left and the handbill in the lower right, because they are handed out and have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the audience, they are not posters. So now they're gone. Now that third bit, a poster is meant to persuade. A poster has to advertise something, and that something may be a product, uh, an event, a candidate, a destination, but it needs to function as a means of convincing the viewer to act. So if, again, say it says, like, live, laugh, love, there's no persuasion in there. You're not being promoted or prompted to purchase or vote in any way. A poster has to be commercial in most senses. It's a byproduct of commerce. So now both of these images are promoting actions of some kind, seeing as an exhibition in the upper left uh, or visiting a skating rink in the middle. So we're still in the green here. However, that last bit, a poster is the marriage of word and image. Uh, this will become a bit more obvious in a second when I talk about the evolution of a poster, but a poster isn't just a picture with text underneath it. Uh, a key thing that in indicates um, the dawn of poster printing is the moment when you produce the text and the image as a single unit that worked in harmony to promote something. So printed matter without any images is typically not a poster. It's a broadside, which is what that exhibition poster is on the left and which will now be removed from the screen. And this is actually where I'm going to start today's poster history lesson. So now, while every country technically has posters since every country has advertising, the majority of poster historians will say that the posters really began in France around 1860 and quickly spread to the rest of Europe and the Americas. Before the 1860s, advertising around the world was limited to broadsides. So text-based announcements printed primarily in black or brown, like, like these. Occasionally, there would be a tip-on, which is, is a, separate, a separately printed piece of paper uh, with an image on it normally a woodblock image. So if you were selling shoes, you might have a very simple image of a shoe pasted into an open area on the paper. Or, in this case, uh, a letterpress recruitment poster where the image, oh, there he is, a letterpress recruitment poster where the image is actually a hand-carved design treated like raised type. Now the problem with these broadsides was that they required that their audiences be literate, uh, which is not really something you can presume <laughs> of all classes at the end of the 1800s in Europe. They also were really drab in color and lacked any kind of dynamism. So unless you were right up on them and a particular word caught your eye, they were pretty easy to ignore. So this image, nope, you're missing an image. Uh, this image is meant to show you how overbearing and word heavy most of these images were. You can see a few hints of what's to come. This is actually a little later than the broadsides I just showed you. But you get a sense of how boring text ads are on mass. Now then, in the 1860s, Jules Charest, known today as the father of the poster, perfected the already developed method of stone lithography so that suddenly, large-scale color lithographs could be made cheaply and quickly. And thus, color advertising on a mass scale was born. A lot of historians refer to this time period, the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, as the color explosion. Uh, because that's exactly what it was. Now, wherever you walk down the street, you weren't confronted with rows and rows of drab text, but layer upon layer of colorful, brightly designed images jumping off the walls, sometimes three stories high. These pictures were so hard to ignore that some critics said things like, these posters were assaulting their eyes, forcing them to look upon busty women selling cigarettes um, and cabarets. But others saw this moment as a triumph for public art. Because if you weren't wealthy, the only other place you would have seen color like this would have been in a church's stained glass. Museums were not yet a common activity for the lower classes, and newspapers were not printed in color. So imagine an entire demographic of society being exposed to big, beautiful design en masse for the first time. This is a revolutionary moment. So now that you kind of have an idea of how wild a time it must have been when posters first appeared on the streets, I want to give you a, a rundown of some of the greatest hits in poster history, uh, the fun facts, the essentials. 
I figure this is more interesting than, say, just going through the major art movements like Art Nouveau or Deco or Modernism. Uh, since it's great to know the general history, but not really, um, don't we just really all want to know the cool stuff? Right. So, cool stuff in poster history, take one. Here. I'm going to start with this proof from 1891 by Jules Charest. We've talked about Charest already. He is the father of the poster, the reason we're all here. Uh, he's the guy that made posters possible. But what we're looking at right now is what's known as a progressive proof. Typically, a printer would make just one of these prior to printing a full run of a poster, and then it would be destroyed. So it's a tiny miracle that this has, has survived. Uh, we actually have this in the museum's permanent collection, and it's on display in our poster history timeline, so if you stop by, you can see it. Um, now, the purpose of a progressive proof is to print every color that's used in the poster and to make sure that all of them print correctly, uh, and that when they are combined, they look good together and line up properly. So we start with the yellow and then probably print the red, etc., building the image with different layers of ink until it becomes a visible figure. So that sort of gives you an idea of how time consuming, uh, by contemporary standards, this thing would be and how precise all of these designers would have to be when coming up with just yellow or red or the blue layer. It wasn't about eyeballing something. You really need math and a sense of space and how colors can be layered to produce additional shades in order to make something like this work. We get an added layer of complication with this design by the fact that it's a two-sheet poster. So you see like the little horizontal line, maybe you can't see it, but there, there's, right, right there. there's a horizontal line um, sort of running through the middle of each image, essentially where her waist is. Uh, so that's where two pieces of paper would meet. Um, it's not just printing one image in multiple shades and colors, but different parts of that image in multiple shades and colors, and then making sure that they also all line up on the wall. Um, also, this is about seven feet high in real life, just to give you a sense of scale. And the reason um, it would be printed on two sheets is because printing presses could only be that big. So they're printed on limestone, which is like crazy heavy. Now this is where this poster gets super nerdy for me. So originally, this image was designed for a department store in Paris, but for reasons unknown, they rejected it. Like, sorry, Charest, you might be the most famous poster designer in the world, but no thanks, um, bye now. Now, because French posters in particular were not necessarily product specific um, when they were designed at this point in time, a generic image of a pretty girl with some flowers, etc., can be used to sell pretty much anything. So Charest shopped it around, and the print dealer, Edmond Sago, bought it. Sago is the dude responsible for really creating the collecting culture of posters that led to us being um, able to have these today. Uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. So after the department store rejects Charest's image, again, Sago is like, dude, I will absolutely take your newly discounted poster design for myself. Um, and so the final design with text um, of this image advertises Sago's gallery in Paris. And wait for it, the super nerdy poster moment is that Sago's great-granddaughter still operates the same poster gallery today. It's, it's way more exciting. <laughs> they sell posters. Now? They sell posters. Um, we buy posters. She, she has this on the wall in her gallery, obviously. Um, now, speaking of Sago, he how is he responsible for spearheading the collecting culture of posters in France? Well, one thing I should tell you is that no poster that was ever physically on a wall survives today. Uh, posters are printed on really cheap paper. Uh, and the glue would make them pretty impossible to tear off the wall. And even if you tried to take it off the wall while wet, it would have just a shredded to bits kind of thing. Like if you put toilet paper on the wall and try to wet toilet paper on the wall and try to take it off, it's not gonna work. Um, so the only posters that survive today are one of two types. I know this is super pixelated, but sorry. Um, so posters that are stolen are about half the posters that survive today. Um, so if, let's say, you wanted this poster by Alphonse Mucha, travesty poster. You could follow around a bill poster, that's the guy who puts up posters on the street, and you could either bribe him or you could just take it when he's not looking and carry it home. <laughs> now we all know which posters are stolen because they have one thing in common, a tax stamp. That's the super pixelated thing. Um, so on the right you'll see what a tax stamp looks like in the 1890s in France. Sometimes they look more like postage stamp stamps in other countries, but essentially, if you see a stamp like this on a poster, it means that that bill poster um, went to some city bureau, paid the taxes he needed to, uh, in order to legally paste the poster on the wall, 
Um, and that's how cities made money, sort of like parking tickets. Um, having a tax stamp on a poster today does not in any way increase or decrease the value of the poster. It's just a, another layer of history. But when you see one, we know it was obtained through less than legal means. The other way a poster would have survived was through print dealers like Edmund Sego that I just mentioned. Um, they realized that posters were similar enough to decorative prints that they could carry them for their clients and make some money. Uh, and they're huge and they're cheap. And so they'd contact either the artist directly or more likely the printing firm and say, hey, I really like that poster Charest's been doing lately. Uh, can you print an extra 50 of his next design for me? Uh, and that's how these dealers would get their poster stock. Now, occasionally, a dealer would also ask for something called a before letters version of a poster, which is just the same poster without the ad copy. Essentially, this is a way to sell a print to people who just couldn't get into that commercial headspace of posters but wanted a cool image. And printers obviously agreed because they're making money too. So, this is an image by Pierre Bernard advertising a gallery show for the Salon de Saint. Uh, both versions of the poster were printed and survived, and both are around the same value in today's market. It's just personal preference that guides which one you would want to collect. Uh, same as back when they were available at the time of printing. So now you know the basics of how posters are printed and the ways that they were purchased and saved. So now I'm going to take, talk to you about a favorite artist of mine, one whose work is inextricably bound to poster history. And that is Lionetta Capiello, uh, known as the father of modern advertising. Uh, this particular poster is from 1903, and it advertises chocolate claps, which is a chocolate bar. Uh, the thing about Capiello that made him the father of modern advertising is that he was the guy that figured out that if you put a figure on a stark, saturated background and use a lot of very vibrant colors, it essentially makes it pop from a distance. It's sort of like creating a spotlight on the poster. A uh, lit from within kind of glow, if you will. So most of his designs, are all central figures in a dark black or dark blue background. Uh, he knew it worked, and he made a career out of repeating it. Uh, the other thing he typically did was combine a figure with an oversized object, very like think big of him. And by making the product super duper crazy large, it drew your attention more to the brand. It didn't matter what it was. Combine someone with something oversized, and it's automatically eye-catching. Now, you may recognize these two posters from upstairs. Uh, the one on the left is indeed by Capiello, who we just talked about. Uh, it's his Contrato Champagne poster from 1922. Uh, this is one of his most famous posters, and it's actually still used by the brand today as the label on the champagne, so you should be able to find it at your local wine shop. Uh, the poster on the right is also from 1922, but it's by Achille Luciano Lausanne. Uh, Lausanne typically had a bit more humor in his posters than Capiello, but essentially here he has taken a cue from Capiello's playbook and is presenting the oversized fork full of pasta to advertise the brand. Uh, it's very simple, delightful, standard advertising trope of the late Belle Epoque period. Now, back to chocolate clubs. Here, Capiello is not really doing the size thing that I just talked about, but he's doing the dark background thing. And what's more is that he's done something here that no one had ever considered doing before. Where's the product? Nowhere. Uh, rather than show a chocolate bar, he realized that he, if he created an image that was really memorable, people would notice it and associate it with the brand. And it worked. When people saw this woman on a red horse, this poster is also incidentally around like six and a half feet tall, um, they remembered her because it's, it's weird. Um, and they'd go to their local shop and they'd be like, oh, you know, get me the, you know, what's it called? The, the lady on the red horse chocolate. That's literally how it went. No one knew the brand's name. They just knew the image that Capiello created, which became the first mascot. Major poster moment, major advertising moment. I also wanted to bring in this other poster in your collection. Uh, it's by Marcello Dudovich. It's from 1918, and it's advertising vermouth. Uh, this image is actually quite rare and beautiful. Uh, Italian posters, uh, for those who didn't get my before, the, the, the sales which I gave before the talk, uh, are typically quite rare and hard to come by, primarily because the collecting culture outside of France and Germany was, was less obsessive. So very few copies of any great Italian posters remain. Uh, you'll know by Dudovich's last name that he's not actually Italian, he's German. Uh, but all of his great posters were made while he was in Italy. Sort of like how Capiello is Italian by birth, but all of his great posters were made while he was in Italy. 
is France. Um, and we typically define a poster by the country of printing, not the ethnicity of the artist, so it's complicated. Um, now, both moving forward in time a bit, Charest and Capiello, who I just talked about, were prolific poster artists during the Belle Epoque. That's a time period in poster history that runs primarily in France between like 1871 and 1914. So a long span of time. Now within that time period was an artistic movement that we all know and love, and that is Art Nouveau. Uh, it's sort of a sub-movement that happens while other stuff is happening during the Belle Epoque. Um, just always remember that art movements never happen in a silo. They're very fluid and often overlap. And the categories can be messy. Now, the number one dude for Art Nouveau is Alphonse Rivet. Uh, I believe I saw a scarf out there. Yes. Um, now, uh, Muka was also the subject of my very first exhibition at Poster House, which I'll also be touching on a little bit later. Now, all of his posters kind of qualify as greatest hits in poster history. He's just that famous. But I'm going to touch upon one that I think showcases how he acted as a counterpoint to designs um, popular during the Belle Epoque. So this is a poster by the artist Romain Pousset. Uh, it, and it's advertising Le Febre Utile. That's a French cookie brand. Uh, in case you aren't familiar with a few of the visual signifiers in this poster, let me tell you that the outfit the boy is wearing is the uniform for a fancy private school. So he's bougie. <laughs> and the medal on his outfit is one for perfect attendance. So he's also a little angel. <laughs> Uh, and this is how Lefebvre and Thiel advertised their product until they hired Luca. Very safe, very straightforward, very meh. And I like to say that Luca took Lefebvre and Thiel from the lunchbox to the opera box. <laughs> As the first of many posters he created for the brand, he has taken the humble snack cookie, a, a nothing cookie. Lefebvre and Thiel is a biscuit that isn't anything special. It's still made today. They still use that Misé image on a lot of packaging. Muka took that mediocre, middle-class cookie and made it aspirational. He pulled a Kylie Lipkin moment and took, to, and took on a cookie. Um, now it's the cookie of wealth. It's the cookie of glamour, of society. And you can buy it. And you can buy it cheaply, too. He created an atmosphere, a mood about a brand, rather than simply an image of what it is. And that's a very clever and not really something anyone else was doing well at that time. He's essentially invented aspirational advertising, which is pretty amazing. I'd also love to look a bit more at Pierre Bernard, who I mentioned in the before letters version versus with letters version of the poster. Uh, that song, the song image. Uh, in case you don't know, Bernard was a pretty well-known post-impressionist. If you go to the Met, um, there's a whole half a gallery filled with his work, uh, including this poster. And as an artist, I find him to be a bit mediocre my opinion. He's not bad, but he's no Monet. Um, he's like a second tier dude in my mind. But in poster design, he's a knockout. And I believe that's because so many designers viewed posters, specifically lithography, as a means of experimenting with their craft without the exorbitant expenses of painting. See, a painting takes a long time. Uh, the supplies are expensive. And you really want somebody to buy it when you're done. A poster, well, they're inexpensive because they're printed multiples. Anyone can buy them. Uh, and you can bang one out in a day or two if you really want to. And I think that's what Bernard did. So look at this poster he made in 1897 from La Stade de la Biche. Uh, it's advertising a magazine dealing with poster art. And you see a weird, like, cartoony woman. Seriously, she looks like a cartoon character out of Robert's Modern Life, or like Rugrats or something. Um, if that's a reference, people only my age. <laughs> um, but she's like a scratchy, funky, weird figure. Uh, and she's watching this little like scam um, of a person dart by with a portfolio of prints. And it's technically supposed to be a metaphor for like the old guard of prints being overtaken by the new guard of posters. Uh, but it's also just a massive de declaration of difference between this and Bernard's formal work. But now look at this image from 1891 for a brand of champagne. I would not presume that this was by the same designer, let alone by the same person who did the painting that we saw. She's some like sloppy drunk feeling herself because she's out partying, drinking champagne so frothy that the bubbles have like overtaken the bottom of the poster. Um, the only real similarity is that crazy handwriting he's used to write the product's name. Now the point here is that he's experimenting, as all of these guys were when they first uh, introduced posters. 
It's a genre that forgives and allows you to feel weird. Now, another designer I love to talk about, but who has a highly complicated history, is Ludwig Bola. So this particular poster is from 1913, so about 20 years later than the posters we've just looked at. Um, he's considered to be the best German poster designer of all time, and I agree. Uh, the image is for a brand of decaf coffee, here exemplified by the fact that it won't give you the jitters, uh, but will allow you to stay oh so calm and collected as you play a nice game of tennis. <laughs> but what makes Holbein exceptional is how he managed to construct figures and space without outlines. If you look at this particular poster, it's cream on white with a few colored shapes, but there's absolutely no outline. We perceive a figure holding a cup of coffee with a tennis racket under his arm, but there is nothing holding those colors together. You see it again here for his poster from 1908 for PKZ, which is a men's department store. The darker stripes of the man in the foreground suit are the background. Oh, there's nothing indicating where he begins and the background ends, and yet we perceive depth and mass. Uh, the same for the figure of the coachman. His body is just beigey plaid, but our brains fill in where his arms must be where his lap happens. It's totally brilliant, and no other designer was really, has really ever matched Holbein. Uh, now let's shift to full art deco. Remember, this is the greatest hits lecture. Um, World War I is over. I very much lost over that. And a man named Adolf Moron Cassandre is king of deco poster design. Uh, you might know him as the guy who stacked the Yves Saint Laurent logo. Um, see, by yourself. Um, he did that. Um, but his bigger contribution was creating dozens of some of the most coveted and brilliant posters that ever happened. Um, and I'm going to focus on his triptych for Juvenet because it's excessively rare and also combines humor and narrative in poster design. And incidentally, this will be in my fall show. And they're about a little shorter than the ceiling of this room. Um, so this image of what's known as the funny little man appeared in various sizes and formats and even situations over the years. Um, but this is the landmark moment that sealed the deal. Again, there are about six and a half feet high, maybe seven feet high, and you would have seen them together on the street, on the side of the building as you walked by or drove by, um, and they tell a story. You see, the man that looks at, sips, and then refills his glass with the product, do the day. Um, an alcohol that's still sold today, it's kind of gross. I uh, don't recommend it, but you'll notice <laughs> that the figure gets more colored in as the narrative progresses. He has become more fleshed out as a person the more he vibes. Um, but the, so it's, it's kind of like a, like a cartoon, uh, like a comic book narrative almost. Uh, but the moment of genius really comes into play when you look at how Cassandra has filled in the text along, the, along with the figure as the story goes forward. He obviously uses the brand's name. But it was really a stroke of luck that he realized his potential as a visual pun of sorts. You see, du beau sounds kind of like beautiful or to observe, du beau, um, in French. Then du bon sounds good. Um, and then the brand's full name. So you get beautiful, good, du um, It's its own tagline. Uh, and no, the brand did not plan that. But if you ever find this set, it's like a quarter of a million dollars, so uh, eyes peeled, everyone. <laughs> The last panel, incidentally, of just the man with the yellow background, that was reprinted in the mid-1950s um, as just a single sheet and used as an actual poster in Denmark. So the design ended up having this like massive life beyond the 1930s, showing how beloved and successful it was for the brand. Now, another major figure to emerge from the Art Deco period was Paul Collin. Uh, he's probably best known as being the first designer to create a poster advertising Josephine Baker in Europe. Uh, the jazz craze was in full swing in Paris at this time, and she quickly became an icon abroad. Uh, Kalan would continue to use her as his muse and model, and he also had a relationship with her for a while. And he also created a lot of the set design for the productions in which she starred. Uh, but I'm not going to focus on that famous poster he created for her, but rather the poster he created in 1938 advertising Leroy, an optician. Now, this poster is in like my top ten, um, easily. It's, again, huge, but just so direct and impactful, you know right away that this is advertising glasses, or an optician, uh, or possibly a horror movie, but ignore that a second. <laughs> you have a super well-dressed man, possibly heading out for the night at the opera, and he has no features, no nose, no mouth, no hair. 
He's just eyes spotlit from the overflow of glow coming off his new Leroy frames, which will allow him to see the evening's performance clearly. It's a very like Baba Boom kind of poster. Also, one thing when I this is also going to be my Deca show. One thing another curator that I noticed when we saw it in person is out of all of Paul Collins' posters, this is the only one where the lettering is kind of hazy. So if you walk down the street, you'd be like, wait, do I need glasses? <laughs> Uh, so now I'm going to fast forward a bit more to the 1950s. Um, what happened between all this? A bunch of war posters. I don't like talking about that much. Uh, there are some cool ones to be sure, but that's a very different lecture. Um, and I want to focus on this poster by Emil Ruder from 1958. It appears in a show I did right before the start of the pandemic that was called The Swiss Grid that explored uh, mid-century Swiss design. This particular poster promotes an exhibition of newspaper history at the Gebirge Museum in Basel. Um, due to the close relationship between museums and schools in Switzerland at that time, this poster and most other posters would have been executed by Ruder's students as part of like an in-class exercise with each student working on a single element of the poster. As the school only had smaller printing presses, this poster is made with two sheets of paper. It, it's not that big though, it's like half of that painting. Um, and you can kind of see the line running horizontally through the middle of the image. Um, there we go. Um, no, that's not where I was. Oh, yes. Uh, but those pieces of paper, unlike the ones we saw that made up the charade poster early on, um, these ones are pretty small. This poster in total is about just like four and a half feet high. Um, now, there are four different things happening in this poster, all of which would have been printed through letterpress, which is where you sort of arrange everything in like a lockup and ink it and then print it, sort of like a sort of a stamp. Um, now the Z is made of hand-cut linoleum. Type was not available in the size that you would need for this typically, so if you got really close, you'd see that there are like a ton of irregularities and like hesitation strokes in how the designer cut that Z, um, so it's not perfect. Then the small text below that is metal type, like the black text on the left. Uh, but the text to its right, the diazitum, um, is wood type. Metal type would have been too brittle and heavy at that size, so they'd have to use wood type. Finally, the, the half-tone photo glow is not a photo at all. It is hand-picked linoleum made to look like a photo. So Ruder, as a teacher, was a jerk and assigned some student to cut little squares at various densities to create the look of a photo. Um, like, why? Oh, <laughs> and all of this, as I mentioned, was then combined into one leather press lockup. And incidentally, to get this flat of black, you have to run it through the press twice. So you have to be really careful it lined up precisely each time when hundreds of copies of this would have been made. Uh, so essentially, by the 1950s, it's all about precision in Switzerland. It's the process for mixing printing styles and techniques and creating something that is both aesthetically interesting and also incredibly clear. Now, the counterpoint to this is the subject of an exhibition that I curated again right after the pandemic ended. Um, which was at, at Poster House, and it was called The Pushman Legacy. And it chronicles the history of this very particular design studio, known as Pushman Studios, based here in New York, um, that served as a counterpoint to the stark version of modernism that we just looked at. To highlight this, I'm going to show you this piece by Seymour Quast, one of the original co-founders of Pushman. Uh, he co-founded along with Milton Glaser, who you'll know from the iHeart New York logo. Um, and this image is from 1967, and it's a fake travel poster sort of, uh, that advertises Travel to Hell by Roots of Dante's Inferno. Um, now this poster was one of three images, all of which dealt with fantasy travel destinations in literature, uh, namely the Lotus Eaters from the Odyssey, uh, the poppy scene in The Wizard of Oz, and uh, as I mentioned, Dante's Inferno. So they're all dealing with sort of a drug-induced state of mind referencing 1960s psychedelic genre that was popular at that time. In all three of these faux posters, because again, they aren't truly posters since they weren't public facing, they are dealing with the language of posters. Um, all three of these would have appeared as an insert in something uh, known as the Pushpin Graphic, which was their magazine. Um, it was a periodical of sorts that would come out sporadically, and it was sent to about like 3,000 art directors and subscribers around the world as a means of advertising the studio. So these art directors would see this weird, unique, like totally bonkers work, and then they'd hire Pushpin to project. If any of you were fans of Mad Men, like me, 
you might recognize this image as it appeared in Roger Sterling's office during the final season. And that's like actually one of the rare moments where set decorators in film or television spot on with, with regard to the poster. Uh, people like Roger would have been getting push, the Pushpin graphic for free every month. Um, so he would have had access to this image. He could have saved it and framed it in his, in, in his like office space um, as the like psychedelic dapper devil, which incidentally was like totally on part of his character. <laughs> um, thousands of art directors did just that, and that's how Pushpin got work. And their style would go on to influence everything from the film Yellow Submarine, um, to Peter Max, to even Shepard Carey today claims that Pushpin was highly influential in how he conceptualized street art. So, what this group accomplished is still felt and resonates with today's graphic designers. Now, obviously, there are hundreds of other major posters in history that I could touch on, as well as dozens of important artists that I've excluded, but I also want to talk a little bit about what I do, since I'm assuming none of you have been up at Mr. House before, besides the man in the front room who works with me. But we have fun. Well, thank you. Well, then, then a lot of this is going to be repetitive for you, though. But this is the first show we did. Um, as Lisa mentioned, we opened in 2019. And when we opened, I made the decision to start with a large exhibition of work by Alphonse Mugo, who we talked about earlier. I chose it because, as a brand new institution, I knew that it was important to get people in the door uh, with as few barriers as possible. And Mugo, even if he may not be a household name, um, his images are recognizable by most people because his stuff has appeared on like coffee mugs and t-shirts and tarot cards and everything. Um, h and did a collab with him a few months after the exhibition opened, so he's famous. His work was so familiar that I felt that people would be interested in seeing it in person. Uh, and they were. People loved Muga. And I was surprised to find out in my research that despite the popularity, uh, there has been no show of his work in New York City since 1921. Uh, when, he would, when he himself put on the show at the Brooklyn Museum. Now to kind of counter his work, um, Cyan, uh, I wanted to sim sim simultaneously expose people to something a little less familiar uh, from a completely different time period and place. So I chose the work of Cyan, um, which was an East German design group that was formed around the same time of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, and they were the one of the first, if not the first studio, to create street-facing po posters using Photoshop. They also totally rejected what I would say is the, uh, the things that make a poster successful. Uh, typically, a poster has to deliver its message in under a second uh, in order to communicate with people walking by quickly and easily. Uh, if your message isn't clear, the poster has failed, is generally what I often say. Uh, now, nothing about their work is clear, uh, but for the things they're advertising, it makes sense. All of these posters are promoting exhibitions or talks or performances and all of the posters are inviting the viewer to stop, slow down, and spend time with the information. It's asking the viewer to help tease out the necessary info to know where to go, where to see it. Um, and because the programming is very much geared toward an intellectual artistic set, uh, creating that kind of like visual barrier as a signifier of who the appropriate audience is for the event in question. Um, I also love these pictures because if you look at them, they were done very economically, as they're typically uh, printed on toned colored paper, uh, and then one or at most two other colors of ink are present. Uh, the rest is just overlapping. Um, and then the images that you'll see kind of fuzzy in the background that they layer, they're photos from old books or photos they took of each other. Um, and sometimes it's like a magic eye moment to see what uh, is actually being advertised, but it's, it's this really kind of cool push-pull situation. Uh, and all the artists have done, the two artists are still alive today, and they donated all the posters to the museum when we did the show, which is also super cool. Gotta save on shipping. Um, <laughs> after this, we wanted to stretch the traditional notion of a poster. So as I mentioned earlier, traditionally posters are a European and American printed medium, but not all countries had access to printing histories when it comes to advertising. So we bent a few rules and created our next two shows um, like this. Upstairs, I focused on Ghanaian hand-painted movie posters for imported American horror and action films of the 90s. Niche. Um, so you probably, you might well probably be Rob, um, or maybe you in the back, who's probably up with me. You might have seen them on Reddit. <laughs> uh, but uh, every few years on the internet, they drop these out um, because they're just a really remarkable sense of 
composition and often like a very wild interpretation of scenes within these films. But the amazing thing I discovered when researching these posters is that they were not really used in like major cities when they went on them, but rather they traveled the countryside along what was known as uh, concert parties, um, bringing together things like speeches, plays, song, dance, and religious sermons all together. Um, and then they would end it with a film screening highlighting specific teachings within the local version of Pentecostalism through American horror films. It sounds weird, but it's real. Um, and I can certainly go deeper on that later if anyone wants to talk to me about it. Um, while this was up downstairs, we did a show with our collections manager, Melissa. She put together a show on the hand of posters from the 2017 Women's March. Um, and rather than just show them as historic objects of a single moment in time, she focused on the repetition of imagery or phrasing that appeared in the posters and how some of those images and ideas appeared in like protest poster history starting 100 years earlier. Uh, the point was that regardless of opinion, and many of these po posters like contradicted each other, they were like from every possible perspective. Um, regardless of opinion, the signs tapped into a collective visual history. And that sort of visual literacy is something that we want our audience to be able to walk away from and embrace. Now, right before we had to shut down in 2020, um, we had just opened upstairs a large show on uh, 100 years of Chinese advertising posters through the lens of economic policy. So how did these posters reflect China's economic systems and relationships with the rest of the world? Um, I thought it was beautifully done, and it really encompassed a very complex and layered history between China and the West. Downstairs at that time, I sure curated a show on the Swiss grid that I talked about um, that had the email ruler poster in it. Um, I activated the hallways outside the gallery to showcase what came before and after the mid-century grid system took over the design world. And we had programming that focused on how these design systems still impact graphic design today. We even like created like a small microsite or website that teachers can use for it, which is pretty cool. Um, and when we reopened, uh, we kept those shows up till February, so essentially like a year. Um, before switching over to two new exhibitions. The first was on, um, it was on loan from the Wolfsonian in Miami, um, and this is on Julius Klinger. Julius Klinger is one of the most important and underappreciated poster designers of the, world. he starts in the 1890s and goes up to World War II when he was uh, killed. He is a contemporary of Ludwig Holbein, and most people think of Holbein the most when they think of this period, but he was just incredible. Um, and the variety within his posters were awesome. I loved the exhibition design, which our dear Rob helped me install, because um, it's just so dynamic and really emphasizes the graphics. Uh, downstairs, we partnered with a gallery out in Colorado that focused on the political posters that emerged out of the writer Hunter S. Thompson's campaign for sheriff in 1970. Did anyone else know he ran for sheriff? I didn't. Um, and while they didn't win, uh, the style of poster design, as well as the messaging, feels incredibly modern, uh, touching on ideas that many people still debate hotly today, from police brutality to climate change to drug reform. Uh, and those issues all found a voice through Thompson's Freak Power platform. That was the name of his party, like Republicans, Democrats, Freak Power. Um, in 2021, I mentioned the Pushpin Legacy. Uh, that was the Dante's Inferno poster. And this had over 100 other posters for an ephemera uh, then emerged from the studio. Downstairs, we did a show exploring the complicated legacy and the impact of black exploitation movie posters and how they saved Hollywood from bankruptcy in the late 60s and early 70s, while also pushing black stories and heroes to the forefront of cinema. Um, after that, this is, I'm, all, I'm almost done at rooms. Um, in February of last year, I curated two shows at the same time at the museum. Uh, the first is on the American female graphic designer, Ethel Reed whose brief, and I mean like very brief, she died when she was my age brief, uh, career led to her being the most famous woman designer at the turn of the century, and yet nobody, nobody remembers her now. Um, and upstairs in my, the show that was my baby, my dissertation, um, I focused on 1920s Soviet film posters for imported movies and how they functioned, how they were often re-edited to serve a more pro-communist narrative, um, and how they were created. Uh, then we went way out of the box in two shows we just closed, uh, we have uh, the curator R.J. Rushmore. He's a he's primarily known as a street art curator, um, and he did a show called Mass Vigilantes on Silent Motorbikes that focused on artists who take posters off the street today and reconfigure them into contemporary art. So very much not what we normally do. Um, while it's downstairs, we just closed another favorite show of mine on Air India's mid-century advertising uh, that focused on the Maharaja. He, he's being re he's, he's being brought back, guys. So he's, he'll be on the poster soon. But all these posters. Travel agencies, 
on the streets in airports, um, and how the Maharaj was used as a means of soft power, particularly during the Cold War, to present India's uh, political views without having to go through the government. Uh, you can definitely talk more about that. Um, and then in uh, one week, so next Thursday, I don't have photos of it yet because we're still building it, um, we are opening two new shows, one on 100 years of Japanese graphic design history, um, and the downstairs show will be on, oh, the brand new Black Panther Party. Um, but uh, I'm most excited for my second show in the fall. Um, anyway, I hope that gives you a little bite-sized idea of what posters are, how we can talk about them, uh, and how they serve as a window uh, into a specific period of time. And I welcome any questions. Well, that was fantastic. And I <laughs> that would get very little uh, air time in an encyclopedic museum. Like maybe once a decade you find a show like this. So it fills an incredible need. Yeah. So how did somebody wake up one morning and say, you know what New York City needs? We need, you know, a, we need poster house. So I mean, that's a big leap. And you, you know, there's a lot of competition in New York City sure. for real estate as well as for cultural uh, credibility. So, I mean, this was a big leap of faith. That, yeah. Um, um, so, there are poster museums in other countries. So, they're, uh, usually they're very country specific or cause specific. Like in Shanghai, there's a poster museum, but it's just on um, the, cult the posters of the Cultural Revolution. Um, or there's a poster museum in the Netherlands, there's one in The Hague. Um, but they, other than the one in The Hague, they usually tend to be very um, <laughs> location specific. Uh, there is no permanent poster museum anywhere else in the world that does the global history of posters. Um, so the, the poster community is, uh, we're very enthusiastic, but very niche. Um, and so somebody was just like, hey, I mean, people have been wanting to build a poster museum in New York since the 70s, and just finally got enough momentum and support that it could happen. Um, the other location that was on the debate was Las Vegas. Um, which I'm glad they did not pick. <laughs> um, but uh, the other thing is they didn't really have a period for something like this. I am one of the three poster historians in the world. Um, there, there just aren't people that focus just on posters. There are graphic design historians. You can get, you get 100 of them. Um, but nobody that focuses specifically on the history of printed advertising. Um, so that would I would say. Great. So I have one more question before I hope others will ask, which is I'm curious for the artists who were working particularly in the 19th century, what scale did they work on? Because today, you know, you could make something this big and a printer could blow it up to whatever size you want. So I'm kind of curious. Printers may have had a lot to do with what we actually saw, because I'm assuming the artist walked in with something not seven feet tall. Well, it depends on um, who the artist was. Someone like Alphonse Mucha or Toulouse Lautrec, they literally would go to the printer and do it themselves on the stone. Uh, Charest would also do that, but Charest owned his own, he owned a printing company. So he, that's why he, he, Charest has over a thousand posters to his name, but he owned the printing company, so he could do whatever he wanted. Um, for other artists like Capiello, we have his maquette, so maquette is the preliminary drawing. He would like show up with something this big and be like, it, it, and the maquettes, they look like shit, like they're awful. <laughs> and he was just like, make this pretty, and somebody who was at the printing studio would then make it beautiful. So a lot of the artistry of some of these poster artists, particularly after you get, after like Luca and Lautrec and Bonard, those are all fine artists, so they were very much involved. Someone like Capiello is a commercial designer. He's like, Here, this, here's my idea, enjoy. Um, and he, the printer was really the guy who, who made it beautiful, and nobody has any idea who that person is. It was multiple people. Um, the, Anybody who worked in the printing presses like are, are unknowns to us. That is, I hope somebody's PhD one day. Um, <laughs> not, um, but, uh, but yeah. Questions? Okay. Well, I just have video fascinating. I enjoy listening to this. Most, most of the stuff you said, I didn't know about it, and I want the audience to know about it on my radio show, so I'd like to, to be my guest. Anytime. 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 Yeah. Anytime. Good just not this week. Learn from the experience for me, and I want to thank Dr. Palandra for inviting me. Being a <laughs> <laughs> you had a question, right? Sorry. Yeah, so uh, we saw the Ethel Reed and the yeah. communist one. I could see how you would know about the communist, but how, how did you know about this Ethel Reed and what was, because that was a fascinating interview. I felt so sorry for her. 
So before they hire me to be, I've been at the museum six years, so since we were, before we built the museum, but as we were building the museum. Um, and prior to that, I worked for a decade for uh, a dealer. Um, he's the biggest and most important poster dealer in America. He's credited with bringing the poster collecting concept to America in the 60s. Um, and he was very generous with his time and knowledge. So I, I showed up as an intern, an intern that didn't want to be there. Um, I, 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 like, if, if you want to intern in New York, if you're like, oh, I want to go work at a gallery, you're like, okay, who's my rich friend whose dad will get me an internship? Um, and my rich friend's dad was just like, you work for this dealer, and I was like, wait, posters? Why would I want to work? I get them at Walmart. Why would I, who, who pays, if I have a half a million dollars about buying a poster, I'm buying a painting. Um, and then within three days, my mind was completely blown and changed. Uh, this little old man was just like, this is how you write a contract, this is how you do a condition report, this is what this is. And he was so passionate about the history that it converted me um, to what I am today. Um, and uh, Ethel Reed, is, her posters are for sale often. They come up, uh, there, there are maybe half a dozen pieces that she does that are very common. Because uh, American posters are very small, our presses were much smaller, they are like, they're like that big. Um, and, so they, they're, they're easily saved, more easily saved than other countries' posters. So they'll be in like the back room of some production studio and they'll find them in a stack of 10. Um, Ethel's posters were $300. They were so cheap. Um, and I didn't really appreciate her work until somebody wrote a biography on her that got completely ignored. Because um, every dealer and every historian about Ethel was like, she worked for two years and then disappeared. Um, and no, she didn't disappear. Like, if you follow the public record, you know that she moved to Europe, she got married, and she died of an overdose. Um, and she lived this incredibly tragic life. But uh, but yeah, it's, it's, I, I know most of what I know because I was working for a dealer. The interesting thing that I, that particularly with, it, with uh, curatorial stuff, is most curators will, they go and like work for Sotheby's. The most specialists at Sotheby's will never go work at a museum. But if you're working at an auction house in particular, which is what I was doing, you're seeing a thousand posters every quarter. The amount of volume that you get in and have experience with is so much more than somebody at a museum would. So you just get exposed to so much. Uh, that provides a great foundation of knowledge. Thank you. Yes? Um, I don't have so much a question. It's a, it's a comment. It reminds me when you showed those uh, posters, those theater posters, those women on the theater posters. It said theater on them. <laughs> Go back to the show. There were like three posters with another set. Wait, that one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what Sarah Bernard. All right. Um, are you familiar with the Laguna Pageant of the Masters? No idea what that is. Okay. Laguna Beach, California. Yeah. Once a year, they have what an art festival with the Pageant of the Masters. And what that is, they take the entire year mm -hmm. to put this together. And they have it in an outdoor theater that is just huge. They have a full blown orchestra. And what they do is they present famous works of art. Mm -hmm. And when you first see it, the way they do it, oh, like a tempo scene, yeah. um, it seems like it's, it, it's just a, like say they'll do The Last Supper. Yeah. And it looks like just a big blow up, uh, you know, they enlarge a, a 2D Last Supper. And you look at it for a while, and then literally people jump out of the paintings. And they're like, it's like, Real, it's not too deep, yeah. three deep. Well, anyway, they did this when I went to see it many years ago. They did this with, with, in addition to like great works of art, you know, the masters. They had, they had posters. Oh, cool! And they wheeled out, you know, they wheeled out <laughs> all these big, huge posters, and they lined up the whole stage. And like I said, literally, I thought they were two deep works of art. And then all of a sudden, these figures, because they put the, the actors in and these costumes, and the way they paint them and everything, it really looks flat. And they, and they jump out. I thought that might be something you someday you go there and yeah. <laughs> Because could you imagine actually people jumping out of these? <laughs> but, but actually, the, what, what, uh, what, I know I work at the museum, but what other things, uh, what other kind of programming does the museum provide other than you know, the exhibition? Or, you know, oh, are you doing a sales pitch? <laughs> 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 it makes me think about 
about the drinking? Is there like a big no, drawing? Yeah. We do a ton of, well, thanks, thanks, Rob. No, uh, we, do, we have tons mm -hmm. of program fees, so every Friday is free. Uh, usually on Fridays we have like dance performances and drawing classes. We've done things where the guy on Antiques Roadshow, do you know the guy with the loud six and big mustache? Mm -hmm. Wow. Nico! Uh, he's my best friend. We've been, we've been best buddies for like 20 years. Uh, we get drunk together and we talk about posters. <laughs> and you too can come and talk to me um, So we, we do a bunch of different things. I also run all of the tours we do for the blind. Um, somehow, I, apparently I talk well enough that I can describe something. Um, but so we, we, have, we have accessibility tours. We have, am I forgetting about a, a poster kids for like little kids? Uh, am I missing anything? Okay. Yes. I'm curious how you chose the area here. Is the airline posters you going to exhibit as opposed to, for example, some in Europe or in the South Pacific? Oh, sure. Am uh, that really to the Indian India, or is there a particular artist, or uh, do you concentrate on that? So Airbnb is, as far as the artists go, they use um, they have their own in-house atelier, so they use a ton of local artists. They also partner with J. Walter Thompson, which is a big advertising agency, but in Mumbai. Um, and then they also would hire very famous illustrators from around the world, like Tommy Unger, um, to do to do posters. So they had this really, they had a really broad array of artists. Uh, we chose to do the show simply because um, I walked into a gallery and I saw that they had a lot of Indian posters, and I was like, this could be a show. So and the follow up to that, do you buy this? Or is the people loan you the posters? It depends on the show. And then also, do you think that they actually hear Indian uh, posters and visual or for them? Yeah, um, many questions. So I'll start with the, 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 the specific to Air India thing. Um, the Golden Age of Travel posters are usually Air India, TWA, and Pan Am. Those are like the big 1950s, 60s, 70s travel posters. They're the most beautiful. David Klein being the guy who did most of TWA's posters, and they're incredible. Uh, his stuff will be featured at Miami Motion History of uh, Advertising in New York with Nico as the curator of that show. Um, and David Klein's stuff is going to be all over that. Uh, we chose Air India because of availability. Uh, well, I, well, I've been friends with a guy who runs uh, the Kapoor Galleries in, on a few blocks away, and he had a bunch of Air India posters. And I knew that the history of marketing them was really interesting because of what India's government was like during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. They couldn't really say necessarily criticize the, the American government, but they could do it through Air India. Uh, so their posters are very critical of different countries and their, and their and various international policies. They got, um, some of them were banned in countries, there were letters written there in the all the time, being like, how dare you talk about France this way. Um, and uh, so there's a, there was an interesting political angle to the show as well, not just like beautiful travel posters. So I always try to find something that's like, here's the beautiful history of these things as advertising objects, but then here's something else that was going on that you might not know about. Um, so that's how we got that show. As far as do we borrow or buy, we do both. Um, for the MUFA show, I, at my old job, I sold the biggest collection of Alpha's MUFA posters to a guy named Richard Buxa. So I knew where the bottom was buried. I'd be like, hey, Richard, can we do a show, a, a show of your posters? Uh, for the Soviet show, I'm very good friends with a guy who owns the complete Soviet poster collection. So we do not have $4 million to buy the Soviet collection. Uh, but for so Soviet, you exhibit, for example, in mean, Rock Chris, obviously, has this huge expression. Yes, that's a little bit later than what we showed in the in fair. There's some stuff later. We do borrow when we can, usually from private collectors. Um, borrowing from a, a museum usually can be more expensive than borrowing from a collector. If I borrow from you, uh, you're going to make me pay shipping insurance, um, and you'll be very excited to have your name on the wall. And that's and, then, and you're not going to really make me pay like here's like a uh, like this kind of loan fee, and this, uh, you have to book it out five years in advance, and you can only take two things at once. And you have to do another guy to get the other two things because there are maximums to how much you can lend. Um, for the Japanese show we're about to do, there was some grant loans from LACMA. LACMA gave permission, and then when they said like, and that'll be for the type of shipping we're going to require you for a for a blazer, uh, it's like an auxiliary item. The blazer is going to be five grand to ship from LA. The blazer I can buy on eBay for two hundred dollars. <laughs> so like to borrow from a museum is actually a pain in the ass. Um, so we try to borrow from <coughs> people. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 For the progressive poster that you shared, how many of those were made? Uh, like, for a progressive group, only one would ever be made. So only there would only be one. One, one for every one. poster that was done, they would make a progressive group. 
Um, so for one to circle, and they would usually throw them out. So like that, if you get up close to the one we have, it's it's blown, it's Swiss cheese. Uh, it's been restored very nicely, but like they are, they're, they're, again, they're printed on like garbage paper. So they were never meant to survive. That's the other thing. I'm dealing with a medium that was meant to, to not be here. Um, so that, yeah. So unlike printmaking, yes. there was no series like one of a hundred. No, no. If, if it's signed a number, they make no poster. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's something precious. It's meant to be saved. It is not meant to be saved. So related to that question, if you had access to any set of posters, past or present, like any, maybe something doesn't exist anymore, but if you are aware, what would be your dream exhibit and why? Cool. Well, the Soviet show was kind of my dream exhibit because that was my dissertation. So like that, I could, I could die happy now. Um, <laughs> I'm, let's see. Oh, I mean, I the stuff from Weimar Germany is probably the stuff I'm most drawn to. Again, crazy rare, crazy expensive if you can find it. I'm, uh, I'm like dark and a little fucked up, so like <laughs> all of that. Um, uh, but yeah, I would love to do, love to do that show. Although I'm, I'm super excited about the potential of doing the Italian food and wine show because Italian posters, a super rare, super sexy. So like it's, it's, it's like the drama of like a, a Puccini opera. Like it's all there, and the French didn't do that. Uh, so I'm really, really pumped for that when that happens. Yes? So we, we did you, you didn't mention this. It was a small exhibit at the same time of uh, 1920s American movies. Yeah. Where did those come from? That, uh, that came, from, came from my buddy Dwight Cleveland. Yeah, that yeah, because right. I was a dealer. They're all, they're all buddies of mine. Like so he just crazy. like lent you his collection and put it on the wall and then went back in afterwards. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, I was going to say, you see your cards do fly. They make them to the France and wherever. And there, it was also special. So yeah, they didn't know the chocolate, I was getting this chocolate, but clearly the woman on the horse was sexual. I mean, like, when does that change then, or where was that? Because then they become, I mean, it started, started out very sexual, the, the photo, or the poster. They, they kind of stayed, they kind of still sexual. Yeah. I mean, after time, after sex, sex sells. Like, after, right. like, sex sells, just the, the how, the, how the sex is perceived is, is, is different. But I would say that, he, that there, no matter what time period you go through, there's always a sexy photo. It just made, like the Swiss grid stuff may not be overly sexy, but the other stuff that I didn't put in the exhibit would be very sexy. Um, but just depended on what artist you were looking at. Like, it was the sex, so sex, 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 sex is eternal. But so to follow up with that question, though, I mean, this country was always great for its time. Yes. So as opposed to Europe, where there was so much more of a mind. Yes. Uh, the pictures that you're showing, which were being exhibited in Paris, obviously, how did the United States react? types of pictures start to appear, or did they actually start to appear with it then? Great question. Uh, so in the 18... Uh, great question. So in the 18... Do you guys know the Grolier Club? It's a yeah. few yeah. blocks away. So the Grolier Club brought the first European poster exhibition to America. Uh, so all the charades, all the sexy girls, uh, they displayed them. And that is how, um, in America, we discovered the idea of like a lithographic pic picture poster that didn't really exist before. Because again, our presses were pretty small. And that was when? That is the, the, the Grolier Board, I think it's, it's either 1883 or 1893, I forget. Um, long time ago. Long time ago. Um, and, uh, but the Ethel Reed show, even though her things do not look risque to us now, though what the, the things that we would notice were, seems incredibly like Uchle, um when she did it. Like it was just like, oh, you're, you're wearing, like that dress with real look good. Um, and no, no, no. Uh, if you look at other posters that were being made at the same time in the United States, the girls are very buttoned up, very proper. But it's it, like there are signifiers that we wouldn't necessarily have. We wouldn't, we wouldn't necessarily recognize today, but they were very like um, in the posters. So they they weren't banned in the United States, but people it was always pushing the boundaries of like how 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 low can we go with this dress? How suggestive can we get with the text? Um, another thing in the Ethel Reed's poster, she added a tagline to a newspaper uh, that was "Ladies Wanted." Um, you can interpret what the "it" is, um, but it, 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 it was written about that they were like, "Is this? Is she? Is she, she looks like such a nice girl." What's she saying? Um, in review, they, they, there were magazines dedicated to posters. Like they were, they were like fan mag, like the equivalent of like a Reddit thread. The the fan blogs or the fan magazines on posters were prolific. There were like dozens of imprints. And they would talk about like, well, did you see the latest poster by this guy? Um, great tits. Uh, like they were, they, they were fans and they were fanatical about it. So, uh, so yeah. The, the, while the U.S. was a bit more puritanical, we still had a bit of risque stuff. It was just, 
edging toward that line. Anything else? Use us as role models. Please tell us the men in the room. I love you, but you wouldn't do this. I mean, you know, it's too much. Yes? A few years ago, I went to a holster gallery. I think it was called Swan or? Swan, so that's an auction house that's owned by my buddy Nicker. Okay, my question is, is there a, uh, many places in Manhattan where you could go to purchase? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there is uh, Chisholm Larson on 8th Avenue. I think there's in 17th Street. They d and each dealer kind of has their own vibe. Uh, so Chisholm Larson is where I go if I need to get something that's, um, I don't go for the greatest hits there. I go for stuff that's weird. I go for like B movie film posters. I go for political posters for, for like political parties you've never heard of. Um, for, for activism posters, like stuff that's that, that isn't like it's more col more collectible, ephemeral than decorative. Um, for uh, for Swan, that's where I go for like the beautiful Belle Epoque and Art Nouveau and Art Deco stuff. Um, there is a dealer that's private on the Upper West Side. I think he lives in like the Apcor, um named Mark Weinbaum, and he's he's the guy that you go to for like the you want a fifty million dollar poster or sorry, not fifty fifty thousand dollar poster. He's the guy to talk to. Um, so everybody kind of has their own niche. Um, but there are, there are tons of tons of poster dealers in Manhattan. I would say there are more here than in any other s city in the United States. Um, and then the next best place to go is Paris. Uh, well, I think this has been fantastic. We definitely want to see the show. Uh, is the collaboration with the gallery in Italy? Is that happening? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> so we want to sign up for the VIP tour for that. And, uh, I, I give I give great tour. <laughs> And um, really, it, this was a wonderful introduction. I Thank you so much. Can't for wait me. to have you back and to come visit you in your home downtown. Please do. Thank you.